I ask you to ask me all of the awkward questions, things that you probably shouldn't ask, and we're gonna answer them all here, as well as talking about my cameras through the years, throughout my career, what they did, what was good about them, and all the rest of that good stuff. Let's dive into some questions first, and then we'll look at this little plethora of kit over here. Now, the first question, and one of the many questions, this is more of a statement than a question, is please don't shave your head again. I didn't shave my head out of choice, my hair fell out. Um, so that's why I shaved my head. It's growing back now, mostly. Um, but there we go, get that right out of the way. So, question number one about actual photography is, if you are a successful photographer, why are you still doing YouTube? Um, good question, good question indeed. Why am I still doing YouTube? Many reasons, one is I enjoy doing YouTube, I enjoy educating. If I wasn't going to be a photographer, I'd probably be a teacher, probably primary school as well actually, um, or work in one of the more difficult schools at a higher age, but that's probably what I'd end up doing. So I enjoy this, I like the video editing, I like the numerical grading system of the work. Like you take a picture and it's hard to go, it's this good. You do a YouTube video and you get a number of views and you go, you've succeeded this much or not that much. Now, there's a backup question to this, which is, do you feel that it's been successful being on YouTube? And I think so. I think I've done what I wanted to do and what I set out to do, which was to offer an education on professional photography that doesn't exist on YouTube. I wanted to kind of give that information out there for free. Of course, I do charge for paid workshops, digital downloads, mentorships, all the rest of it, but predominantly I wanted to put information out on the internet for free that would help people like myself get into this career when they don't know anyone in it and they don't have any idea of how to get into it. So that was the plan and I think I'm achieving that. And I'm gonna continue with it until, until I get bored, then I might start something else. Why do you wear the same clothes in all your videos? This outfit here, there's this one here. This is, because people ask, this is a United Colours of Benetton denim jacket. And this is from some trendy shop in London, I can't remember. And then I have a grey jacket, a chore jacket, which was made for me. Um, and the reason we wear them is, I normally wear a jumper or a hoodie. And you can't clip this microphone here onto a jumper or a hoodie when you have a beard because there's too much fiddling around going on. So this works really well. It also means color grading is easy because it's always the same, you don't have to worry about stuff. I tend to wear this jacket in the winter because it's a bit warmer and we can't have the air conditioning on to heat the room. And it matches the blue light that comes through the windows. And I wear my other jacket, which is a, a yellow jacket or a, well, a beige jacket in the summer because it matches the golden light that comes through. That, that's the reason for it. And yes, it's cold in the studio when the heating's off, but my heating's up on the ceiling, it blows, so, you know, can't do that. Okay, particularly piercing question, I don't understand why anyone would pay for your work, uh, which is a comment I get on YouTube quite a lot. Your work sucks, your work is basic, it's not even that difficult to do. Yeah, but people do pay for it because I do it better than anyone else does, and that's what all photography is. It's not whether you're the best photographer, because only one can be that, it's whether you do the thing you do the best. Now, mine happens to be particularly commercially viable for almost all brands, um, which is useful. So my, my taste might not be your taste, but it does happen to be the taste of people with money, um, which is a good thing. And a question I get asked a lot is, what happens if you fall out of favor? What happens if your work is no longer in trend and they don't want it anymore? Well, I'll keep doing it because I like it. I like what I do. Um, yes, some of my work is not as good as others. Some work's really good, some work's meh. Um, some of the work I get paid to do, I don't like. Some of the work I get paid to do ends up in my portfolio, which is not Tin House Studios, it's scotchyourthinio.com. Um, two very different businesses, completely separate walks of life. But whether or not photographers on the internet like it is a moot point. The amount of likes I get is kind of irrelevant as long as people do like it. Um, what does matter is that the art buyers, creative directors and art directors like it. And I think this is a big point for all photographers don't listen to other photographers on the internet's advice. Um, generally speaking, if their advice is worth giving, they won't give it to you for free. If they're offering free unsolicited advice on your work, chances are they suck. So, advice for all. Which YouTubers do you watch for photography? And this is a great question. I don't actually watch many YouTube photography channels, but the ones I do watch and the ones I do check in with are the Photographic Eye, uh, grainy Days, which are really long form videos. I just like his personality really. And then there's a guy called Paulie B who does one called Walkie Talkie series, which is where he goes around with street photographers in New York. Really like that, they're all great ones. And I like Peter McKinnon, I watch all of his videos. Not because I think I'm gonna learn great photography from him, but because his videos are absolutely brilliant. Uh, I always like Van Neistat, his channel's really good as well. Um, I used to like Casey and I, something did the daily vlog, but I do like Van Neistat's videos, they're really good. 
Is having a social media presence a requirement for drawing in potential clients in 2024? No, you don't need a social media presence to get, you know, work, um, but it doesn't cost anything but time to be on social media, so you'd be a fool not to do it. Um, and, and I mean, like, whether presence, you mean like having half a million followers or just being on there, I, I think you should be on Instagram and you should be on LinkedIn. They're the two social media platforms which are best suited to our work and to getting jobs. Um, Facebook's a waste of time. Uh, TikTok's too young. So they're the ones I'd go for. I think by not being on them, what you're saying is you're not engaging in society norms. Um, right or wrong, you know, I wouldn't be on social media if I didn't do my job. Um, so yeah, I, I think you should be on them just to show willing, especially if you work in commercial world and advertising, like a lot of our adverts end up on social media. If you're not on there, how can you possibly understand what's required of a social media shoot? How do I pay for my team for personal projects? Um, good question. So whenever we're doing the big test shoots and it's all personal work for me, uh, some people are getting paid, some people are not. So here's how it works. If there's something in it for you, you're probably not getting paid, but I'll probably be covering your expenses. Um, if you're actually laboring, you know, assistants, digis, retouchers, then you're getting paid. And the way we fund it to be economical is we do it as a percentage of what we charge. So most test shoots cost one to two grand per day, um, but relative to what we charge for a commercial job, it, it's a small percentage of that. So we know that we can afford to do so many of them. If you're only charging a thousand pounds a day, you probably want to keep your test shoots down to you know, 50 to 100 pounds expenses. But the problem is, if you don't test shoot at the level that you want to work at, you won't get that work. So if your test shoots aren't as good as a six-figure campaign, you're not going to get a six-figure campaign. So you have to invest the money. It's one of the biggest marketing expenses I have is test shooting. Um, and yeah, that, that's how we do it. So before we go into some more questions here, somebody asked me to talk about the cameras I've used throughout my career and, and what they've been like. Now, I don't have all of them, but I do still own my first camera, and this is this one. This is my Zenza Bronica ETRS. Um, it's a 645 film camera. I love it. Waist level viewfinder, which I've always enjoyed a waist level viewfinder. So you get down there, focus your camera, fire it, crank the shutter on. Good to go. Put that in a better location. There we go. So this is my first camera. It cost me 200 pounds back in 2009. I got it in a camera shop in an arcade in Cardiff. And I got to shooting, joined the dark room at this uh, independent place, developed my images, scanned them in, shot my first paying job on that camera. I then borrowed my uncle's 450D. I then bought a 50D because my friend Hits had the 5D Mark IIs and there were similar button layouts and I was working a lot with him. When I worked with him, he gave me this camera here, not this exact one, this is my personal one, which is a 1DS Mark II with a 24 to 70. I can't remember how many megapixels it's got, but it has some pixels. It's a nice, big, bright viewfinder. Makes good noises. It's got autofocus. Ways to turn this, flash on top, power pack on the bottom for the flash all day, 2470. I think I often use a 24 to 105. I shoot weddings with him. Real robust bit of kit. It would get covered in booze, you know, dropped, bashed, just like on a strap at your side, smashing into brick walls all day. Really good bit of kit. I loved using this camera. It felt like a solid camera. But better image quality than that was this one here, which is the 5D Mark II. Now, whilst I was working with Hits during this period, I bought a 5D Mark I, which I think I left at the Flash Center or somewhere like that for repair and just forgot about it. So I'm sure it's in a bin somewhere. Um, I got it during like Jessup's or Jacob's closing down sales. It was a second-hand one. I got it for like 400 pounds. It was great. I used it up until 2017 as like a BTS camera. But then I bought a load of these 5D Mark IIs. This is the first one I bought. You can probably see it's held together with gaffer's tape. Um, has it got any charge? No, there's no batteries in there. This, is, this was it, 100mm Prime, the F2.8 Ultrasonic, 5D Mark II. Shot my first worldwide ad campaigns on this camera. Shot some celebrity portraits on this camera. Shot my girlfriend's book cover with this camera with an 8518 on the front of it. Some Bowens flashes and location, plugged in with big extension reels. Great bit of kit. It's, uh, it's served me well. It's made me a lot of money over the years. Downside to it was the resolution and like the density of the files. They were quite thin feeling. So we've got the 5DSR and Zeiss Otis. No, Zeiss Milvus, that's it. Zeiss Milvus, Macro Planar, 100mm. Upgrade in lens, upgrade in resolution. Slight upgrade in actual like a colour science, not massive though. 
used this for many, many years. Probably started on this one in 2016. Um, yeah, this is my original one. I always keep trying to keep the first of each. So I've got the first of this, first of this. Um, very good bit of kit. Shot with that until we upgraded to the Fuji a few months ago. It's still great. It will still do the job today. I've shot huge campaigns on this, huge worldwide campaigns. Um, and then personal work and everything in between. Lovely bit of kit, really rate this camera, still would buy it today. And then my daily shooter is this beauty here, which is a Canon F1. So it's got the, let's just get that open. There we go, the waist level viewfinder, looks like I say a level waist level. I've got the standard one to hold it here too, but the waist level is for me what I like. So we've got film in it. It has got film in it. I'm assuming it's 400 speed. I should probably keep a note of that. This is beautiful. It's fully mechanical, doesn't need a battery to work. You can have a battery for the light meter, but I don't use it. I just use a handheld meter. Um, 28, 2.8 lens on the front of it. This is my go-to focal length. And it's just a beautiful bit. You've got a nice bit of brassing on the corners where it's been used over the years. Um, but yeah, lovely bit of kit. Comes along with my film holders. So in here we've got, what's this? HP5 and a couple of rolls of Portra. So I like Portra 400 and I like HP5. 400 speed films, basically. Um, this has got HP5 in it, and this has got HP5 in it at the moment, running a very black and white setup, but that's how we get down. Can I talk about my inspirations in photography? And yes, I can. So this here is the Democratic Forest. This one is the first edition in the US. Um, I have the first first edition as well, but this is William Eggleston at his finest. I'm just trying to carefully show you this. This is the one we have out to look through. Um, but this guy here is one of my biggest influences in photography. So The Democratic Forest is one of his first books. Um, and he was one of the first people to use colour photography as an art form. Colour photography was always just just for hobbyists, just for fun, for family pictures. Black and white is what the artists used. And he moved to, I think it was like Memphis or something like that. And he was just like, what do I photograph here? Everything's so boring, everything's so mundane. And his friend luckily told him to go and photograph the everyday boring mundane things. So there's these beautiful, like just images in here. And, and it's sort of what inspires me to do my work. I just, I don't photograph fancy food. I don't photograph fancy things. I photograph everyday items. Um, and that's what I like, you know, making the everyday, but it does cover back on carefully, the everyday feel good. So I have two copies of this book. This one here, thankfully, is the one I'm supposed to be thumbling. It's got its nice dust cover on at the moment. But yes, this is great. I think this one's only a couple of hundred pounds. Obviously, the first, first editions are quite a lot more expensive. But William Eggleston's work is just absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. One of, one of my biggest influences, I think. Um, just turning everything, everyday mundane, into interesting things in a colourful way. Shot a lot of Leicas, shot on a Kodachrome a lot. Probably still does shoot on Kodachrome. It's very into his printing as well, making sure he's got the right sort of dye transfer prints. So really interesting photographer. Definitely one of my big influences. What gear do I use to record my YouTube videos? So I've got a Sigma 18 to 35 1.8 zoom lens on a Blackmagic 6K pocket camera and a Rode wireless mic, that's it. And massive windows lighting me at the moment. So the light might fluctuate a bit because just use natural light, it's beautiful. Huge windows, so might as well utilize them. What amount of time do you spend on marketing and networking versus actual photography? Huge amounts on marketing and networking. Um, what I say is a ratio, 20 to one, probably. 20 to marketing and networking, one to photography. It changes throughout your career though. When I was doing smaller, cheaper jobs, I did a lot of jobs and not as much networking, but with bigger jobs, you shoot less often. You know, I don't shoot every week, even for personal stuff. I don't take a photograph every week. Well, probably on my phone I do, but you know, there's a lot of planning. And even when we do shoot now, the shoots are so important that they're actually pushing my career forward. So we spend a lot of time planning. The last test shoot we did, probably in planning for a couple of months, not like solidly, but like over a couple of months, we're planning on it. We're already planning the next one and how to finance it and you know the budget for it and exactly what we hope to achieve from it. We don't just take pictures for the sake of taking pictures. We take pictures with an aim to make more money from these pictures. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of time with that. And then we have to make sure we know the right people. So it's going to London, going to parties, going to lunches, going to book reviews, going to like showing my book at agencies, taking my agent out with me, my agent going out for me. 
And he goes out a lot with clients, and then Karen sends a lot of my work out to different places, my book to different places, e-cards, physical cards, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, stuff happens, a lot of it. Okay, I have a full-time job and I want to start doing photography jobs. What should my approach be? Because a lot of clients only work Monday, Friday, nine to five. You're right. If you want to be a photographer, you need to be free Monday to Friday, nine to five. And if you have a job, that is very counterintuitive to it. So here is what I used to do. This is not advice, but let me just tell you what I did. I used every single bit of annual leave for years and years and years to do photo shoots. And I pulled a couple of sickies when I really shouldn't have done. But that's what I did. And then once it got too much, I left the job, I worked nights, and I shot during the day. It was hellish. And then I left the nights, and I just became a photographer. Um, you said you have a couple of huge jobs each year and lots of little 5K ones in between. My question is, why don't you do more 5K jobs? Um, why don't we do more 5K jobs? It's just not worth it. It's, um, I mean, if we did one every single day, it'd be worth it. That's a lot of work. Like, I mean, yeah, if money was my only motivator, I'd be pitching for loads and loads of 5K jobs. But in doing that, you have a lot of admin and you'd have to have staff and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for me in my business model. I'd rather do four big shoots a year and then if small jobs come in which are fun sounding or look good in my portfolio, yeah, I'll do them, but I don't need to do them. Um, so we don't, like why bust your ass for, I mean like say a five grand job, Half of that's your take home, two and a half grand. It's gonna take, what, a week, really, for a day shoot if you add in emails, pre-production, prep, shooting, post-production, second round of post-production, invoice, invoice chasing. It's not a day's work, is it? It's never a day's work, so I, I just, yeah, I don't think it's worth it. So I'd like to know if the customer or art director and the likes can take BTS pictures and videos if you set up, uh, making it one more thing to share on social media. How do you deal with that? Do you allow it or not? Yeah, do what you want, my set. Want to take pictures? Take pictures. Um, generally speaking, there's an embargo in that you can't show what we're shooting, um, but that's come from them anyway, not from me. I'd love to show what I'm shooting. Um, but if it's, are you worried about people copying your setup? No. Um, there is nothing, I mean, like we get a lot of jobs where someone's already shot part of it before and they fell out with a photographer and they want us to do the next bit. It takes me half an hour to work out exactly how they've done it with no information apart from the photograph. Me showing my lighting setup isn't going to lose me any work because anybody can work it out, it's basic physics. Um, there's only so many variables and you can work them out pretty quickly between shadow, fall off, light direction, focus for, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not rocket science. We've matched identically stuff to go into composites that someone's already started working on. Um, and you'd never know the difference. Even using different brand lighting and cameras and stuff, we can still make it look identical. I'm a fine art photographer. How can I transition to fashion photography while magazines do not like my fine art? Well, if you're shooting something that your potential clients don't like, shoot something they do like or find different clients. So if you want to be, if you're a fine art photographer and want to shoot fashion, go and shoot some fashion. And this goes for anybody. If you want to shoot, if you want to be getting paid to do something you're not doing at the moment, go and shoot it. If you don't show them that you can shoot that work, they're never going to book you. Um, you know, and if they don't like your work, then that's on you, not on them. Right, quick fire questions. What am I benching nowadays? I benched 90 kilograms for 10 reps last week. Um, I can still feel it seven days later, but yes, 90 kilograms. Um, short arms though, not much movement. What bikes are you riding? I've not rode a bike for a very long time, but over here I have my old winter training race light from 2005 and a turbo trainer, which I sit on and exercise during rendering. Um, and out there I've got a 2008 Kona steel single speed bike, um, which is quite nice. Uh, what's my new car? My new car is a Mercedes CLX with the V6 three liter and it is old. It's about 18 years old. And we're gonna see how long we can keep it for. Maybe, maybe one day it'll, it'll go into classic car insurance area and I can save some money on that. Is the new dog here to stay? So for those who don't know, we had a Romanian uh, rescue dog come to our house to visit and he didn't leave. He's still there now. His name's Loki. He's a good boy. Uh, he gets on really well with Moggy, my cat, and they just sort of, yeah, live their best life. You know, a few, few problems at the moment. We need to work on some training, but first of all, we want to get him settled in nicely. Okay, more big questions. You need to be in a big city or a strong economy to make it as a commercial photographer. Kind of. So if I had my time again, I'd move to London and I would save years on my career. I live one hour from London on the train. 
and it makes that much of a difference. If I lived in the arse end of nowhere, it, of course, you can become a top commercial photographer, but you don't have to travel for work, but it's just so much easier. Like my advice to anybody is, if you can move to London or New York, hop on a plane, get there. It'll make your life so much easier. Trying to do it from like, I'm trying to think of some round the world places which we can pick out here. Uh, Toulouse in France, Seville in Spain, um, anywhere in Southern Italy, anywhere in England outside of Manchester or London. It's just so hard. Like why, why make it more difficult than it needs to be? Um, and, and I say it's so hard, it's nearly impossible. From my city, there's been me, Amy Brammel, and Joe Whitmore, I think, who've like made it into London photography world. I'm sure there's someone I'm missing out that I don't even know exists, and I apologize if you're watching this, but do come say hi. Um, but like, it, it's not normal, it's not the norm. So, there we go. Of the commissions I get, how many are directly attributed to having an agent, and how many are directly approaches to you or from your own stuff? Could you survive without an agent? Yes, I could. I could very much survive without an agent. Um, I could survive running my business from my bedroom. But an agent does a few things. One, they're a stamp of approval. If you have an agent, it means you are in the league where you get the big money. And clients, when they approach you, go, yes, this is the right person, they have an agent. Another thing is they go out and market on your behalf and they do pull some work in. But if your work sucks, there's nothing an agent can do to get you work. So if you sit there going, my agent's not getting me any work, that's not your agent's fault, that's your fault. Everybody who has an agent, when they sign with a new agent, they'll hear somebody go, that agent's rubbish, they didn't get me any work, I had to leave. Ask that photographer how much work they're getting at the new place, and I'd imagine it's similar. So, yes, they're really good. They do all the admin, they do all the emails, the negotiating, all the stuff I don't want to do. And of course, I could make more money if I did it all myself. But at some point you have to, you know, let go of some of the money and also, like, I like to, get rid of things I don't like to do. I don't like to clean, so I don't clean. I, can, I am fortunate enough to be able to have a cleaner. You know, I don't like to edit, so I don't edit. I have an editor. Like, all these little things. I, I hate chasing late payments. I hate negotiating, so I have an agent. Um, but yeah, it won't fix your career. If you're getting no work now, getting an agent won't fix it. For most people, there's the odd exception to that where if you're really new and really talented, it can help get your name out there, but it still takes a year or so. How do I keep up? with the styles and advertisements and stuff. Um, you just have to be aware of what's going on in the world. There's no like, I don't know, forum or website or magazine where you go, this is the latest trends. You just need to be aware of what's going on in the world. Like don't be one of those people who goes, my generation do this, so this is what we do. Like I have TikTok. I doom scroll TikTok every now and again. I, I watch like Sarah Chamberlain vlogs. I watch what the kids are watching. I always ask our kids, what are they watching on social media? What are they looking at? What are, what are they gaming? What are they doing? Because if you don't know these things, then you're just out of touch and you can't possibly create good work for the masses. Of course, you can create beautiful artwork for a very niche population, but if you want to be a commercial photographer, that's not the one. Is it worth building a portfolio of film and digital images? Now, I don't fully understand this question, but I think I do. I think you're saying, should I have one portfolio for film photographs and one portfolio for digital photographs? Let me tell you this, nobody cares what your photos were shot on. There'll be the odd occasion where they'll be like, can you shoot it on film? But he, I've had people ask me to shoot on film and I've got no film in my portfolio. And I just say, yeah, of course I can. And for those who can't, because I know assistants who do this, you get a film assistant and they help you do it. It's the same thing, nobody cares. Mix it all together. No one wants to look at a film only or digital only portfolio. If you work on just film, cool. If you work on just digital, cool. Do what works for you, do what makes you happy, but don't think that people are going to care what you decided to work on as a medium because it just doesn't matter. Okay, last question. How's it going with my new agent? Well, he's not so new anymore. Um, I've been with Pete, Andy, and Karen, who are the trio at Agent at Large, for a little while. We started last year. We shot a few campaigns, it's going pretty well. They're really nice people, I really enjoy working with them. You know, Karen comes on my test shoots, she drives up to me to like be here for the day in the studio. You know, Pete and I go out quite a lot, Andy helps all the film stuff, which I've not done much, really, any yet, but he's there for when that does start coming, becoming a thing. Um, and yeah, I like the way they work, I like the way they negotiate, I like the way they do business. It works well for me, it's a good fit, and hopefully they're happy with me as well, but there we go. Should I phone them and ask them on camera? 
No, let's not. Let's not, just in case that backfires massively and they fire me. That'd be awkward. But there we go. There's my Q&As. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.